tomorrow will be ha uh, Happy Birthday Day for Lenora Johnson Delarkey, and she'll celebrate, I uh, hope, in a healthy, happy way all day, and many of us can wish her the best. Uh, the council uh, does not have any news at this moment to, to be announced, but I do have one announcement about Fellowship Hall, which is closed to us today. Uh, St. Macarius Congregation is hosting their Palm Sunday luncheon, so they are making full use of the hall today. Our coffee hour will be held in the narthex through the doors at the back of the church. <laughs>
Please be with you. And I'll talk with you. Jesus, the true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine builder. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and become my disciples. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen.
directly from the Lake Erie Islands. My grandfather had 40 acres of Concord grapes. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that his land was covered with these long, uh, 200 yard or more fences, three wires on the fence. And they stretched way off into the distance. And these, and one fence after another, after another, side by side. And near each fence post, but not necessarily limited to the post, were grapevines, old grapevines, that my grandfather and his ancestors before him had used to raise grapes. That was their sole crop. If they had a bad crop, they had very little money the next year. If they had a good group, crop, they had a healthy income. So my grandfather was very careful with these grapes. He was a good grape farmer. Every February, while the plants were still dormant, he would go out and he would trim all those great plants um, in all those lines of fences, all the vineyards. It was a huge job to cut them back just right so that the next crop might have the chance to grow up instead of all over the, all over the vineyard. But even with his best effort, by the time I arrived and school was out and I got there in July to help him with his work, we had to tie up the grapes. Tying grapes, that's a great job for an 11 or 12 year old boy. Standing on one side of the vineyard of the fence while my grandfather was on the opposite side we worked opposite one another for days after day after day, tying up the grapes. Because grape vines, the grape, grape branches don't obey the rules. You might say to them, they'll grow up this year, but they still grow out this way, laterally. And many of them grow down and plant themselves on the ground. Now, there are a couple of dangers there. The first danger is that as soon as Grandpa decided to plow those vines, those vineyards, he cut them off. If the branch was on the ground, it would be <coughs> off but plow, and there would be no grapes from that area that year. So we had to get the vine, the branches up off the ground and tie them with a piece of straw on one of the wires going down the fence. There were three wires, and we always had our choice, depending on what would be easiest on the branch, because we didn't want to injure those branches. You see, the grapes grow from the branches, not from the vine. They grow from the branches, and the branches have to be fashioned to the wire strong enough so that the branch itself and the wire will hold up the grapes as the bunches of grapes grow and get heavier and heavier and heavier as they ripen. You see bunches of grapes, I'm sure, in supermarkets, but I, I don't know if you know how they got there and how they grew and what it took to produce a bunch of grapes. I was a city boy. I didn't know anything about farming, but I learned a lot on my grandfather's farm. I not only learned how to milk a cow, but I learned how to tie up grapes. And tying grapes is an art in itself. You have to pick up the branch very carefully and, and put it next to the wire and then take a piece of straw from the bottom of your carriage and loop that straw around and tie it tight enough so it will hold for a couple of weeks until
until the wine itself takes hold of the water. Great vines, great friends, uh, very interesting things. They have little tendrils that when they touch the water, the branch gets a signal that its job is to send its tendrils out and wrap itself around that water. And so each great branch eventually will tie itself to the water, and those tiny tendrils, dozens of them, will be strong enough to hold up the line when the brakes begin to ripen. It's a wonderful process. God has invented to grow grapes. I remember seeing somebody on a television one night saying, these grapes are so good. How do they make them? I don't know what she was thinking of, but, but they don't make them. God makes them. And they're made by the great vine itself. It digs itself, the vine itself, the plant itself, takes four years usually before it begins to yield any kind of grape. But it digs itself, its roots go deeper and deeper into the soil. One of the big problems with great branches that end up on the ground is that they send their tendrils down into the ground, attaching themselves as roots. But if that happens, they will be no great. It's not their connection to the ground that allows them to yield grapes. It's their connection to the vine. The original vine is what puts forth the energy and the uh, ability to uh, turn uh, little tiny green clumps into grapes that we can enjoy with our meal. Grapes are wonderful things. And Jesus used this illustration of himself as the vine and his followers as the members as an illustration that all of them could understand because it was a rural environment where he preached and the people he talked to saw grapes grow in vineyards every day that they walked around the, the universe that they lived in. Grapes were all around them in the Holy Land and still are. Grapes. Great vineyards. Great and their long arms that stretch out. Some of those the branches of the great plant would reach out six feet, seven feet, eight feet, a long distance. And one of the problems that I found as a youngster trying to pick them up and tie them onto the wires was that they would tie themselves onto the weeds that were growing on. And so you had to cut them loose from those weeds so you could lift them up. The great branches needed to be lifted up, freed from their tie to the ground, and the tie where they would be most productive and bear the most fruit on the waters. Give them a chance, and they'll attach themselves in order to be more productive. But grapes need a lot of care, and they need, need a lot of attention. I think my grandfather appreciated my help, although he didn't say so. I think he treated me more as an oddity from the city who came up where I got his work on occasion. Although I did my best to tie up the grapes and keep up with it as he moved down each vineyard. Well, Jesus called himself the true vine. And his word to his disciples was, stay connected. Stay connected. Don't let any problem cut you off. Don't let any 11-year-old who's clumsy pull you loose. Stay connected to the vine in order to be productive, to produce good fruit. Good fruit. That was Jesus' test. Produce good fruit. 
I think Jesus had us in mind, perhaps, as he talked about the importance of each of our witness and each of our productivity. We are to be faithful and to be truthful. If we're faithful, we will be truthful. And if we're truthful, it comes from keeping ourselves connected to the source of our faith. Phillips Brooks was the rector of the great Trinity Episcopal Church in downtown Washington. Still there. The marvelous building, the marvelous great congregation, and they worship faithfully every week. You can watch the cars pull up and the people get out going to Trinity Church for a great service. The Phillips Brooks was the pastor of that church. And one day, he didn't know about this. In fact, he never did know about this. William James, at that time, some of you will know the name, was a psychologist teaching at Harvard University. And in one of his classes, one day, one of the students asked him, uh, Dr. James, will you please define a Christian? And William James stopped cold. He walked for a long time, walked beyond the moon, walked over to the window, and looked out at Harvard Yard, and the people were walking through it. And he finally said, I don't know how to define a Christian. But there goes Philip's Brooks. What if someone asked me to define a Christian? I don't think I could answer that either. But I think I could say. There it goes, and put your own in here. The Apostle Paul did his best to define a Christian. He called it being led by the Spirit. In fact, he called them the fruits of the Spirit. That if Christian people connected themselves well enough to Christ. This is what they would do. They would love. First of all, they would love. If you want to follow Paul's definition, it's in Galatians chapter 5. Paul wrote this to his fellow Christians. Love is, first of all, a characteristic of the Christian. But there's also joy, not just happiness, not just being happy, but being full of joy. When we're connected to Christ, we find ourselves full of joy. Those who abide in Jesus are filled with it. And next is peace. A Christian has gives the fruit of peace in all relationships and the peace with God because that peace comes from abiding in Jesus. And then there's kindness. Simple kindness. Christians are kind. I don't know how to define Christian, but there goes those books. There goes you. <laughs> Be kind again to someone, to everyone. And there is generosity. Another one of the person who was close to Jesus Christ. Followed by faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. If we are attached properly, faithfully to Jesus. That's what we do. That's who we are. Those are the behaviors that characterize us. Wonderful fruit of the Spirit. And leave it to St. Paul to come up with a list like that.
since the five weeks that Cal has died, it's been very hard, and I know you all know what I'm going through, but I want to express my appreciation for all your prayers, your love, and your care. It has helped me get through. Thank you.
attention to the fact that we skipped the Lord's Prayer, which we should never skip. So we're going to sign together in the Lord's Prayer. 